you know, tro- trophies collect dust, ribbons get put in boxes. It's the memories that we're collecting and that to me is worth every mile I'll put on my poor truck and my poor trailer. Welcome to Appaloosa, more than just a color breed, a podcast dedicated to showing the world the versatility and adaptability of the Appaloosa horse, as well as the people devoted to enhancing and preserving this outstanding breed. Hey, how you doing today? Thank you for joining me at the only podcast that talks about the Appaloosa horse and the people who own them. This is episode number 33. Today, we're going to talk to the 2019 Appaloosa World Championship Sportsman Award winner, Tina Jackson. That was just one of the awards her and her husband got at the 2019 Appaloosa World Show. And so without any further ado, here we go. Hey, Tina, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Since this is your first time on the show, let's go ahead and start with how long have you been involved with horses and how long have you been involved with Appaloosas? Okay, um, I started horses when I was seven. Um, so that's back in the 80s. Let's put it that way. Um, and I was into quarter horses and showed quarter horses through the 2000s. Uh, took a little bit of a break, um, and then we moved to Kansas about six years ago and had some unfortunate events happen. And my husband and I talked and decided, okay, we want to start over. Um, we want a family friendly breed um and so we went to a couple local shows to decide and that's when we chose Appaloosa so it was um uh, roughly we bought our first Appaloosa see baby horse is two almost three so five years ago we bought our first Appaloosa um that was Casey's finders okay so now what discipline did you do when you did court horses or did you have a particular discipline that you did um I did all around but my my major, I guess my my love or my passion was in the hunter ring. So I did all the overfence classes. Okay. Our trainers made us do all around events because I have no <laughs> idea why. But I'm grateful for it now. Back then, I used to cry and throw fits because I didn't want to do it. But now it's like, okay, well, I understand. But you're talking about your trainers when you were youth. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All right, well, let's get into that. Um, if you don't mind talking about it a little bit, you said that you guys had some unfortunate events. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, we moved to Kansas and love this place. It's a old farmstead. And uh, we moved our horses here from Louisiana. And we moved in January. In February of that year, we had a, a barn fire. Um, And we had lost, we lost six horses in it. And of course, all my equipment and everything was in it. And it just, I mean, we literally watched it burn to the ground. We had two survivors, um, one of which we, we, we had a good friend of ours, Wayne Walker. He lives about eight miles from me. He and a good, another good friend of ours brought their horse trailers over and hauled them to the vet for us. Uh, one of the horses had to be euthanized immediately. Um, her injuries were just, it was just too much. There's no, the prognosis of her ever healing was too great. And the other one was my son's pony. Um, and we fought, we fought for almost a year to try to keep her going. And uh, she succumbed uh, Christmas Day a year later um, due to internal. Uh, external, she looked like she was healed. Internally, she was it was a horrible mess. So that was I, that was when I I threw my hands up and wanted to quit. And my husband said, "No, we need this. Our boys need this. It, it, you know, you've talked about how horses did so much in your life, taught you so much more than anybody. And we want to do this for our kids. Let's buckle down. Let's 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 start over. Let's start completely over." So we, that's when we started searching. Now, that was right after you guys moved to Kansas. Was that right? Did I hear that right? 
Yes, sir. That was right after we moved to Kansas. We we moved to Kansas January 1st, and uh, a month later, the barn went up. That's one heck of a welcoming gift. It was. It was. We, um, <laughs> I still, yeah, still have nightmares over it. I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you well, why. I mean, a lot of people, like you said, would just throw up their hands and go, I- I'm done. I- I, you know, no, I'm not going to deal with this. Because, I mean, that's, you know, we get really attached to our horses, you know, and, and to lose that many at one time, I-, I don't know if we would come back to it. I'll be honest with you. I mean, that's, that's devastating, not only financially, but emotionally, too. So, yeah, I could. I can understand what you're saying. Yeah, I'm done. I'm 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 out. <laughs> so, and you know, the fact that you guys are still here is probably a good testament to your fortitude. So after that, you guys said you went to some Appaloosa. You said local Appaloosa shows, right? To um, the local Appaloosa show, we went to the local quarter horse show, and we went to a local paint horse show. And I deliberately dressed like I'm at the farm cover all dibs whatever i don't even remember what time of year it was or if it was cold or anything but i didn't dress up to go to the show i just came as i was and i sat down on the bleachers and i watched and my husband was walking around you know looking at the horses and he sat down with me and we noticed we talked between each other and we noticed how people would react to us because we want a family environment You know, we don't want to have to dress up or put on a show just to come and watch a show. We want to be welcomed for who we are. And but the Appaloosa people were the ones who really, I mean, I didn't know anybody from Kansas when we just moved here, um, especially not in the horse world. And we show up and I don't even know who this person was. And we sat down next. I was like, do you mind if I sit down? Oh, sure. No problem. We started talking, and they were introducing us to all all sorts of people. And we went home that night, and I looked at my husband, and he looked at me, and he goes, that was a nice experience. I said, I agree. So that's when we started saying, okay, I've, you know, I've never, ever even imagined going app. It was always cool to wear paint in my brain. And um, that really is what our turning point was, was we were welcomed scruffy jeans and all hey welcome welcome to our show um do you know anybody here who's your favorite rider that kind of thing yeah i mean that was kind of our experience when we went to our first appaloosa show was everybody was really friendly and all that now obviously we already had appaloosa and we were there showing but um you know we've been to quarter horse and stuff like that and it's like eh, it's not really our our style i guess you could say but yeah the appaloosa people were always really friendly uh, you know, especially the other non-pros that are out there competing and stuff like that. Well, um, I mean, the non-pros are even the trainers. I mean, I, I get intimidated. I know a lot of people get intimidated because there's these big, I mean, they're, they're household names. If you're in, well, most of them, it doesn't matter if you're quarter horse, pain or appy, they're all in the same. They They do them all. So it's kind of like, oh my gosh. And I can honestly say I've met several trainers and all of them have welcomed me with open arms with their, you know, Hey, I have a question. I don't quite understand this. How do you, whatever. And they have been very forward. And for non-pros, you can't get a better group of people. You can't, they will help each other. We've been to shows like in North Dakota, there was a woman never showed halter in her life. Didn't have a clue of what was going on. And she, we were like, okay, let, you know, you need to go put a long sleeve shirt on. So she ran to the truck, grabbed a long sleeve shirt on. We're like, oh, she goes, but I don't have a hat. Well, you know what? We pulled one off of some other exhibitor that had the same size head and threw it on her head and just kind of walked her. Okay, this is how you do the class and, you know, walked her through it. I don't know too many other competitors that would be willing to do that. Yes. Yeah. You know, usually you go out there and it's, it's almost, it's, cutthroat and here there are people willing to go hey you have a nice horse come on into our class try this class out you know this is how we do it i made a, a fashion faux pas at a at a show and um i was running ragged we bring four horses i've got five kids and we were running crazy trying to get make sure everybody's in the right class and i went and showed and realized i didn't have a hat well you can't show in, in halter without a cowboy hat on and 
uh, lady was standing there with a showmanship horse, and I looked at her, and I was like, can I borrow your hat just for two seconds? And she, she said, sure, here, put it on. I walked right in the arena with her hat on. I mean, that to me is amazing. Absolutely amazing that exhibitors are willing to help each other out. And I mean, it's, it's like a family. I mean, they say the Appaloosa Horse Club is a family, and I truly believe it is a family. Yeah, I agree. We, like I said, we've had many of the same experiences. You know, Heather showed Halter, and there are times where we're like, hey, yeah. can we borrow your hat? <laughs> Everybody's done it. You know, I mean, you forget things. So, what was the first Appaloosa that you got? The very first Appaloosa we got was a mare named Miss Mysterious Eyes. She was given to us by a friend of Aaron's down in Louisiana. And um, I, I didn't really want anything to do with her, to be honest. Um, she was an Appaloosa. And at that time, I didn't want anything to do with Appaloosas, I'll be honest. And so she just kind of was hanging out in the pasture doing nothing. Um, she had been ridden as a two and three year old and shown extensively down there. But not in Appy shows, just in local cuttings and rainings and stuff like that. The little jackpot events they have down there, which are almost a dime a dozen, where they were when we were down there. And then she just stayed out in the pasture. So she was down there when all this went, all the farm fire and everything. And um, the second horse we bought was Casey's Finders Keepers. And that's when we said, oh, wait, we still have this horse down in Louisiana. Let's go get her. And since he's coming in and we'll... You know, see what, see how this combo is going to work. Essentially, we'll dissect them and we'll see, um, you know, form to function. I want a correct horse as correct as I can get that can perform because pretty, you know, pretty is as pretty does, but it's a lot easier to feed a pretty one than, you know, one that's all sorts of wanky, I guess is the best way to put it. Right. <laughs> I hear that from my wife all the time. <laughs> pretty is as pretty does. She's, she used to tell her students that all the time when, when she taught riding lessons. And like we'd we'd have a, a student that, you know, got to the point where they want to start buying their own horse. And she'd always tell them, look, this is your first horse. You know, this is not going to be your keeper. So, you know, pretty is as pretty does. If it does its job and it does it well, that's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. We're not looking for flashy and all that. <laughs> I, when you said that, I just got chuckled because I used to hear that all the time from her. Well, that's kind of interesting that you guys pretty much jumped right into a stallion, basically your first horse, mm -hmm. uh, into the Appaloosas. Was there a reasoning behind that? Um, I've always had stallions. Um, ever since I was, I, my first stallion partnership, I was 13 years old. And I just loved being able to, well, I always look at the faults of my particular stallions. I don't look, I look at the good, but I primarily focus on the faults. Because I always say, if I have the faults of this stallion and the faults of this mare, if I get a resulting foal with nothing but those combined faults, what do I have? Our goal is to, to help the Appaloosa breed, to promote it, to bring better specimen, I guess, out there to improve the breed. And if I have a foal of these faults, will that help the breed? And it's just a, it's, it's a passion. I just love seeing the results. Yeah, I get that. I know Heather's the same way. And I mean, she kind of does it kind of in a way that you're talking, but yeah, she'll look at a stallion, you know, with, we'll have one of our mares and she's like, all right, this is where she's strong. This is where she's weak. And then she'll look for a stallion for strong points in the mare's weak points. Mm -hmm. And that way, you know, whatever well, this this mare's got a long neck we need to look for a stallion with a shorter neck or you know whatever you're saying a little bit different but it's the same way that she says it. you know she's looking for those that combination of good points and bad points of the stallion and the mare trying to overcome the faults of each of the other one mm -hmm. sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't okay. <laughs> It's a catch-22. You never know. That's the reason why I always say if I get the faults of the mare and the faults of the stallion and I res the resulting foal is nothing but everything negative, what will that foal possibly look like? Yeah, I like that. I you know, because if it's a marketable foal, okay, it won't be a world show quality foal. But if it's a marketable foal, is it a 4-H foal? You know, is it something that can still have value in the community? Would it be a good good horse for a trail rider 
Yeah, I guess in the way that you're doing it, it's kind of you hope for the best, but you plan for the worst. Exactly. And so that's, I mean, yeah, I get that. You're like, okay, if, if this full ends up with all the bad qualities of both, is it still good? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay, I get it. I mean, yeah, that's, like I said, it's plan, hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. You know? So I guess it works. Oh, well, you know, everything to be, come out as a world champion, but the chances of that are not there. Astronomical. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right. So what was next? You guys got your stallion and then you bred to the mayor, I assume. And mm -hmm. what was the result of that? The result of that is my 2017 Philly um, Sporting Bright Dreams, also known as Baby Hoss. I think everybody probably knows her that's been around me any t any length of time. And she's been the one of a, she's been a sort of a guinea pig ever since we, we had a really rough start with her we still don't know why first four months it was hit or miss of whether or not she was going to live she just couldn't keep her plasma levels high i mean it was down to 32 couldn't figure out why ran i don't even know how many tests and we're trying all sorts of things and then all of a sudden she just started getting better and obviously she's thriving now with no problem yeah, see, we had that problem with Bruiser, too, when he was young. He just would not stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And we finally, we sent him over to our vet, and he had a new young vet. And she did, well, I forgot what it's called. It's basically you take manure from a healthy mare or a healthy horse, and you mix it into this concoction, and it's got probiotics and all that other kind of stuff. and you basically shoot it into their stomach and you do that. It's, you know, a treatment for a little while, you know, a couple of times a day and all that. And it worked. And it's, he just popped back. And after that, you know, you couldn't stop him. You know, he's healthy after that. And we always joke around with her like, man, you got to market that stuff. Cause her last name is Schiller. And we were like, you know, we marketed as Schiller shit shakes, you know? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it was great. I, I read about it in people. And I've read about it in some other stuff, but I'd never witnessed it. But I mean, for him, he just wasn't thriving. You know, there were times where he was pretty bad off and, you know, we'd try things, the vet would try things and it, he would kind of get a little bit better, but then he, then he would start sliding back downhill. And she did that. And ever since she did it, he was fine. And I'm like, okay, all right, that's a testament right there. <laughs> so. that, yeah. They they keep us on our toes, to say the least. Right, right. So now you guys have had some other problems, too, along the way. Do you want to talk about that? Well, we've had several different types of problems. You know, my husband works off. That that in itself is hard. Right. You know, we have the farm. There is 14, 15 horses here and three young little boys. And, you know, there's times they need their dad. And it, it gets hard. We're working on trying to become where we can actually be a family where we're all together all the time. As of right now, that's still not an option, but we're getting closer. Uh, we've had a lot of different issues. We've, you know, we've lost my dad two years ago. That made a problem. Um, my health, that's been probably the hardest thing to deal with after the fire was my health. I had a mini stroke and um, I have a disease called myasthenia gravis, which means essentially muscle death. Um, the neurotransmitters that go to your brain, from your brain to your muscles to tell your muscles to work, go off and party or something. I don't know what they do, but they go off and decide they're not going to work anymore. And um, so instead of being able to walk or breathe, they just won't. And so I've had, I've been in, in and out of ICU I can't even count how many times now because of it. And it's, it's changed a lot. It's changed a lot of our lives because of it. Um, that's one reason why we switched to halter. Because I was trying to barrel race through it and my body just quits. Um, the last wake up call was I was at a barrel race and my husband was helping me and he got me up on the horse. And this was a really good horse. He knew his job. And we came around the first barrel and you just watch, you can watch the video and you just watch my hand just drop. Um, I felt that and I hung on and he finished the pattern by himself and stopped at the gate and waited for my husband to pull me off. 
because my body no longer worked. Um, and that was just a wake up call. Like, Hey, you can't, you can't be doing this. You know, it, it's too dangerous. I mean, yes, I wore a helmet, but I don't know how fast a barrel horse comes off a barrel, but it, I've got too much responsibilities to be able to play stuff like that. Right. Right. Yeah. That is a good horse. So again, we're talking a lot of people in your situation would have just said, screw it. I'm done. I, you know, I, I can't keep doing this, but you guys keep going on. What, what is driving you guys to keep doing what you're doing? We have support in each other. There's days where I do throw my hands up and say, I can't do this. This is crazy. And my husband and my mom and my kids are like, hey, let's do this. Let's, you know, take a break. We've got this. We can do this. It it takes a village. It takes family. But it's something that we all enjoy. We love, we love the horses. We love riding and working them. We love the thrill of competition. And it's just, it's, it's a family event. It's something that we, we as a family have come together and said, if it, at any point it becomes a chore, if at any point it becomes no fun, it becomes a job and you have to do it, we quit. That day we will sell the farm and all the horses in it because it's not worth it if you're not enjoying it. But we all enjoy it. I love seeing my boys out there playing with their horses. And we have a small pond and they go and they take their horses out in the pond in the summers. And they're jumping off their backs and they're swimming with them. And it's just, it's something I can't, I can't describe. It's just something inside of you that keeps you going. We're blessed. We are truly blessed. God has blessed our family on so many different occasions. And that blessing keeps us going. It keeps us motivated. It keeps us, it keeps us together. It's the horses that help are helping us bond, if that makes sense. Yeah, I all. get it. I understand that. Yeah, I understand, you know, we spend way too much money and time on these horses <laughs> for it not to be enjoyable. I mean, yeah, there are days that it it's downright miserable, especially like last week when it was single digits here in Oklahoma. <laughs> it's, it's like sub-zero and you're like, I fed some horses, you know, and it's like, yeah, those, those are the days where I don't, I don't really care for the horses or I wish that I had them at a, a training facility or something where yeah. I didn't have to deal with it. It's when you go, I wish I had a couple of barn workers. <laughs> <laughs> They could deal with it instead of me. I mean, yes, for me, be... the feeding's not the bad part, but we do. We have a uh, an older, used to be my wife's show mare. She's 30-something years old, so her grain is usually a mash. We we do the mash for the babies also. So for me, that's what is like, man, if it's frozen, then I got to go out there and I got to thaw it out and, you know, the water buckets and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, man, come on now. <laughs> it's, that, for me, the feeding's the easy part, you know, it's because we... We have everything already set out, you know, as soon as we're done feeding, one feeding, we go ahead and fill everything back up so it's just ready to go. And same thing with the mash, you know, we'll we'll feed it and then we'll go put new stuff back in the bucket and put the water in there so that it's soaking. And by the time we do the next feeding, it's nice and soft and all that, which the older mare, she likes that. It was really weird because... She was getting to where she wasn't wanting to eat, and we started doing that mash, and all of a sudden, now she'll be standing at the gate waiting on you, telling you, hey, it's feed time, <laughs> you know, which she knew to never do that, and so we're like, all right, well, we, we found a trick now, so <laughs> let's go. So you went to World this year. Now, Aaron doesn't ride. Is that correct? Um, He rides at home. Okay. But we don't, we don't have any riders yet. Well, that, I was going to ask is, I mean, you got some younger ones. Or are you going to turn any of those into riders eventually or no? Yes, sir. That's our plan. Our plan is uh, we, we, we like to show Halter the first several years of their life. As you know, you've shown Halter. They, those horses are broke. They're broke to sights and sounds and weird. The weirdest things happen to them when they're, they're getting fitted up for Halters. I mean... They are used to farm machinery and clippers and shows and everything. So we like to show them the first several years just to get them used to being out and about seeing the world. 
Yeah, you desensitize them, and then they also know how to load and unload a trailer. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You just point at me. You just open the doors on mine, and mine will climb right in. Mm. They're like, okay, and, and they know when they're supposed to load. They they know who goes where. Right, right. Which is really, funny. you know, the, it gets them broke. And so when you go and show them under saddle, it's not all new to them. They just have to deal with you being on top of them instead of all the other. You know, they're used to being banded. They're used to being clipped. They're used to the whole nine yards. So now the only difference is you're on their back. Right. You know. All right. So you guys went to World this year. How did that turn out for you? We had a good World. Um, my darling husband came home with a World Championship trophy in non pro two year old stallion. Um, Terry Sartain had taken the stud about 60 days out and, and really had him looking amazing before, before Aaron took the lead. And then, um, Baby Hoss placed, I, don't, I think we got several top five with her, uh, a couple top ten. We just, we went to the Appaloosa Halter Futurity and the the little weanling we have, in fa- his name's Infectious. He placed 11th out of 15 or 16, I believe. So I was really happy with that. We're do-it-yourselfers. So that starting out, I think that's a pretty good uh, start for him. Um, and then he... We did the most colorful with him, and he, I think we got caught off the rail twice. I'm terrible about keeping up with where we place. My husband could rattle all this off. He's really good at <laughs> up with, oh, you placed this in here, and I'm like, okay, that's awesome, honey. Thank you. Which one is raining on your parade? Is that the Philly? Raining on, raining on your parade is our two-year-old stud. Okay. He is owned by a uh, a gentleman that actually lives in Marion County named Ken Christensen. Um, he owned um, the mayor. Well, his wife owned the mayor and we made a deal. And so now we're co-owners on the, on right now, well, we call him Spaz. And he's actually in under saddle training right now. Okay. I was watching you guys on the internet, you know, the live feed and all that. And I was like, you know, that's kind of aptly named. He's kind of aptly named raining on your parade. Cause there were a few people that he kind of rained on their parade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's uh we, we come, my, that was my husband's name. He came up with that. I don't know where he comes up with the names. Well, it's like we, he named our 20, 2019 cult infectious. And I'm like, I don't, know where you come up with these names but they they fit they just happen to fit the the year of the horse i guess right right so you guys and you ended up getting an award yourself too correct yes sir yes sir i did and i'm very i'm still humbled and extremely proud of that um i earned the sportsmanship the non-pro sportsmanship award um and that was a complete surprise i didn't have any iota whatsoever of what was going on and why I was being called in the arena. And that's when they presented it to me. Now, what is, what is that award? What, what are the, I don't know, qualifications or how do you get that award? Is that just kind of a people's choice award or something like that? I think, I think it is a people's choice award. Um, like I said, I didn't even know anything of it. Um, they told me that it's based on, Watching, I, I think some of it was some of the ring stewards may have a, a, a vote in it. Um, just people in general have a vote in it. They want to see somebody that doesn't necessarily win and they still want to help out other people. You know, they're still keeping the good attitude. Um, hey, you can do this. Hey, you had a great class. Hey, your horse looks amazing. The little things like that is what they're looking for. Okay. Okay. Being a good sportsman, you know, hey, you know, you, you beat my horse, but yeah, you, you have a really nice horse there, or I placed higher than you, but man, I love your outfit, you know, things just to keep people being a good sportsman. Right, right. So your boys showed at youth, right? Or, or youth world? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. They did. All three of them. And how did they do? Did they take these same horses or did they have their own horses that they took? They took um, one of Sporting Bright Dreams went for Youth Worlds. Um, that's the same mare that I show, my two-year-old mare. And she won uh, junior mares, and she was reserve world champion in mo- youth, wo- youth Most Colorful. 
um, a mare that we own named DZ Blonde. Um, that is my son's, two of my sons share her. And she wound up being fifth in lead line with my youngest, Cree. And she unfortunately got disqualified in Hunter and Hen because my middle son got so excited, he started skipping through the pattern. <laughs> What do you say to that? I mean, he was you just so excited. There's before. nothing you can say to that. I was like, stop, don't skip. And I kind of got in trouble for yelling that. But, you know, I'm like, oh, he had such a beautiful pattern going too. But he was so happy. I mean, we actually have a photo of it. And he's got the biggest grin on his face. And I'm like, that's what showing's about. Right. You know, that much. I mean, he was just happy to be there. We brought my son's um, game horse. Uh, dirty, what we call him, dirty spot. Um, and uh, he, he, that was his backup horse because his original horse got injured, and it was one of those where we brought him. We didn't know for sure he would be sound, so we left him at home and grabbed the backup horse. And they, they had a, it was an interesting run, couple of runs, but they, they did really good. So he still plays top five. So. Overall, I think they did. They had a really good, good experience, and they actually asked if they could go back. Oh, that's good. So I guess we'll be making another trip to Youth World. <laughs> so I was watching you at Color Breed Congress again on the live feed, and it looked like you were flying a kite in one of the classes. I assume that's your your young filly that you have. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. They uh, well, that's when it was. What it had been what. 60, 70 degrees, and then it decides to go 20. Yeah, they they don't tend to, to like that. And they um, was letting me know under no certain terms that we probably should have lunged them a little bit more than what we did that morning. <laughs> well, it was funny because I was watching, and you guys were up against the wall, and, and Aaron was standing there, and you were on the other side of Aaron, and I kept watching him. He kept looking over the top of his horse, or he'd look under or kind of step off to the side just watching you, and, you know, every once in a while, she would just pop up and, you know, decided that she wanted to, her feet not to be on the ground. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I was telling Heather about it. I'm like, yeah, I was watching Tina flying a kite at Color Breed Congress. <laughs> yep, it's part of the lovely you know, it was just feeling good, I guess. Right. That was the first year in probably three or four years that we haven't been to Color Breed Congress because we just didn't have anything to go, you know. So since we sold Bruiser, you know, we don't have anything old enough to go yet. You know, everything else we got is weanling. So next year, that might be a different story. So well, I hope so. I hope to see y'all there. Now, you said you're, you went to a show a local Appaloosa show. Was that the one that's down in Wichita? Is that the one that you went to? It's the one in, they have them every spring in Hutchinson. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. Yeah. Hutchinson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We used to go to that one. I, I was thinking Wichita, but yeah, you're right. Hutchinson. Is that the yeah. only Appaloosa show around that you're aware of? Yes, sir. The, um, the Kansas Appaloosa club only has two shows per year. They have one every April. And then one, I think it's in August or September. Um, and they only do the two a year. And this year they did one in Hutchinson. The April one was in Hutchinson. And then the later one was um, in Lyons, Kansas. Okay. So what do you guys do to qualify for World? Because obviously two shows isn't going to cut it. Well, in the Kansas club, you can qualify. If you're a member of each club, you can qualify through that club if you attend both shows so you do you can get a club bid right which will allow you um but we travel extensively to make sure we get the points needed to qualify so we we traveled oh i don't even know how many different states or how many different shows but we were we were hitting on average two a month up until worlds so now that Pinos has decided they're going to accept characteristic Appaloosas, are you guys looking at going to their shows to for your younger horses and stuff like that? Well, we will because the, like the Kansas show is a Pinto show as well. 
it's the they call it tri spot. So it's Kansas Paint Pinto and um, Appaloosa. Okay, so that was my next question I was going to ask is, do you know if the Kansas Club is working with the regional pinos to kind of do combined shows? But that answers that question. I didn't realize we've been to that show, but I didn't realize it was all three combined. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, I think it's good. You know, it gives another association. And there are, you know, I'm in a lot of different forums and some, some of people will say, hey, it's just too far for us to drive to a local Appaloosa show. You know, we're looking at five or six hours. And to me, I'm like, oh, five, six hours, no big deal. I do that, you know, every other weekend. But I understand some people just can't make that six-hour drive. Um, and now that they're going to have the Pinto, they can still show their horse. Their horse will still acquire points from what I understand. I don't understand all the parameters, but um, then they'll be able to qualify for Worlds. So they'll be able to still qualify even without having to come to an Appaloosa show and still be able to compete at Worlds. Yeah, there's so there's basically two ways that it'll work out. They can either do it under the ACAP program and accumulate mm -hmm. enough points for the ACAP program. However, with the ACAP, the year that you qualify doesn't qualify you for World. It's the next year. So if you're showing 2019 and you accumulate you accumulate enough points to qualify for world it won't be till 2020 but if that pinto show has a aphc carded judge those points count for world this year so that's two different ways that they they can do it um i think that's actually going to bring you know i think that's going to help bring more people to the shows I mean, I, I'm interested to see. I'm not against it. I'm never against change. You know, it, it's uncomfortable. Change is always uncomfortable. Um, and but it's a try. It's a try. You know, how many people? You know, they look at the trainer aspect. How many people have trainers? A lot of those trainers show in paint and pinto. So maybe they'll be able to bring more horses and more apt to to these shows. Right, yeah. You know, or your horse would have to stay home because this is a pinto show. Yeah, and like I said before, you know, here in Oklahoma, the a Appaloosa Club only has one show a year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, we could do it like you said, we could get a bid, but it would be better to qualify, you know, through points, particularly if you're trying to bring up a young horse, you want them to get the you know, the experience the exposure. and exposure. Yeah. So it'd be better to take into more shows. And for Pintos around here, there's four shows this year. All right. Well, not this year, but for next year lined up right in our area within a couple hours from us. So yeah, as soon as they announced that, I was like, yo, great. <laughs> you know, cause now instead of having to travel all the way down to Texas, even to go to Hutchinson, you know, for us, that's about a four or five hour drive. And it just makes it easier, you know, and I don't know. Yeah. I have most of the people I have talked to are positive about the Pinos. I've had a few people, most of them are like Appaloosas aren't Pintos. I'm like that, you know, Daryl Bilkey has said it's not a breed registry. It is a show registry. It, well, it's a color registry. It's, that's how it started is the Pinto is a color. It's not a, it, it's not a, it, paint is the color breed registry. Appaloosa is the color breed registry. Right. Yeah. It, it's a color, it, I mean, not color. Um, Appaloosa is the breed registry. Paint, Pinto is the color. Same thing with paint is actually a registry. Cause you can have a Pinto colored paint, but it, it, but you can't, you can have a paint colored Pinto, but not necessarily a Pinto colored paint. Except. that, you know, yeah, it can be registered with Pinto, but it, it doesn't doesn't qualify for paints, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, I think that I mean it's a good catch-all type association that allows you to have, you know, your horse registered. I'm I'm I don't see any problem with the Pinto Association. I don't, and they are a very fam uh, very family friendly place. Well, you know, it's not very often that you can walk into a show and there's the president of that club 
and you can just walk up to him, sit down, and start talking to him. Um, you know, I was at Color Breed Congress, and there's Daryl Bilkey. He's sitting over there, and I just walk over, and, hey, how's it going? And sat down and talked for 30, 45 minutes. I kept trying to get him to record it, but he wouldn't let me. <laughs> but I was like, we, we got to get this interview done. He's like, I know, I'm just so, you know, he's all over the place, man. I mean, he goes to not only the Pino stuff, but, uh, you know, the saddle bread, the, you know, all that stuff. He's, he's all over the place, you know, the long ear. So I was like, we, we got to get this done, man. He's like, I know, I know. It's just, you know, let me slow down a little bit. I'm like, do you ever slow down? And everybody around him's like, no, <laughs> but yeah, you don't, you don't get, you don't get that very often. No. I mean, try doing that with the president AQ, AQHA. It's probably not going to happen, you know, or a lot of the other breed registries. Well, is Aaron, um, is he handy? Can he build that shelf for all those trophies y'all got now and all that kind of stuff? Or are you just going to have to go out and buy it? Well, <laughs> I, I, I get to get, have him home and, uh, for Thanksgiving weekend. So we're pretty, we're trying to get things. The honeydew list is, is stacking up on him every day. I, I tell him something else I want done before he leaves. So yeah, he's going to have to build me something because uh, I'm running out of room right now. And if this continues, which I hope we are definitely going to need more trophies for next or more trophy space for next year. <laughs> well, that's not so a, be, that's yeah. always not a bad thing, right? No, that is not a bad thing at all. We, you know, the memories that come with them is what we collect. You know, tro trophies collect dust, ribbons get put in boxes. It's the memories that we're collecting in that to me is worth every mile I'll put on my poor truck and my poor trailer. Well, on that note, I don't think I have anything else um, unless you can think of something that we didn't cover that you might want to talk about. No, nope, just uh, I'm loving the fact that we are part of the Appaloosa horse family. I mean, it's like I said, I, I couldn't imagine being where we are today in a different association. I understand. We're do-it-yourselfers and it's Proving that you can do it yourself, you know, just takes a little grit and determination. I agree. I agree. Well, thank you, ma'am. And my wife says you are her hero. Many times I've heard her say that. So I hope you guys have the best of luck. And hopefully we can talk to you guys later on down the road about some other good things. Well, we would love that. And give your wife the biggest hug from me, please. Not a problem. Like I said, she... She says you are her hero. So I was like, well, I got to I, I gotta have her on then. Well, <laughs> that means the world to me. It really does. All right. Well, thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. If you like what you heard, please go subscribe. We are pretty much any place that you can get music online. Pandora, iHeartRadio, Radio FM, any of those places you go to, Google Podcasts, you can subscribe to the show. If you do that, you'll make sure that you'll never miss an episode. Don't rely on social media to let you know when there's an episode. And then go tell a friend about the show. If you like what you heard and you think it's a good thing, go tell a friend. Share the show with a friend. Better yet, show a friend how to subscribe to the show. Until next time, happy trails.